What's not a morning person? My me, I'm Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards, the show where we talk about the worst people in history, and I introduce the show badly. Uh, today we have an unusual morning recording at an ungodly hour. W- what is it, Sophie? It's eleven thirty nine a.m. I I feel like I'm the first person who's ever been awake this early. Aside from my guest today, of course, Mr. Daniel Van Kirk. Hello, thanks for having me back. How you doing, Daniel? I'm great, my man. I am wonderful. I Daniel, go ahead. Oh. No, no. You. Oh, I was just say I've I've been up for two hours, so. Ooh. I feel that's it. very impressive. <laughs> do you do you like mornings? I do not, but I've recently found out that I am able to get so many more things done the earlier I get up, which would seem to be very simple math, but nothing that I had personally made any uh, efforts to experience until recently in my life. So I I, th- I would say on average nowadays I'm up around before eight, maybe sometimes six thirty, but. Uh, I am not a morning person. I hate sunrises. I or love sunsets. Robert would say, 6.30, that's the middle of the night. <laughs> well, if your windows are That is are when I went to bed last night. It is? Um, <laughs> thereabouts, maybe 5.30. Well, I appreciate you making this effort then, man. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, my sleep schedule is still all fucked up from the flight. Sure. Now, Daniel... We've we've established that that you're sort of ambivalent towards mornings, leaning towards not liking them. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you feel about brains? How do you feel about your brain? I feel pretty good about it. Uh, you do? Yeah, it's held, it's held up pretty well. My memory is still very good, and That's good. I haven't gotten to the point where I have to have a calendar. I would say I use it for about fifty percent of my stuff. I should be using it for a lot more, but mine's held up so far. I think. Well. I think most people like their brain except for the moments when they hate them. Um, And I think that probably for the listeners of this show, uh, statistically have spent like, I don't know, about 50% of their waking hours not liking their brain because this is a show for depressed people who like to hear about terrible things. Mm -hmm. Um, As a general rule, that's that's our demo, isn't it, Sophie? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I deal well, with depression the... and I like screwed up, fucked up shit. So <laughs> yeah. I guess I mean, I'm in the right me, place. I mean, me too. <laughs> well, Maybe I'm describing the author of the show and it's, it's, uh, its primary cast more than the listeners. I hope the listeners are happy, but I'm making an assumption here. <laughs> Either way, you're here for them. Yeah. As of a 2017 study by the Journal of Psychiatric Services, more than 8 million Americans suffer from severe psychological distress. Now, this is a blanket term for, quote, feelings of sadness, worthlessness, restlessness that are hazardous enough to impair physical well-being. That sounds pretty familiar to me. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and that number doesn't include all the Americans struggling with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, psychosis, depression, and a whole galaxy of other brain-based thingamajigs to deal with. And to some extent, it's always been this way. Huge chunks of people have always had brains that don't let them comfortably interface with mainstream society. Now, we're not great at helping people with mental illnesses in 2019, but a few decades ago, we were much worse at it. And today we're going to talk about the man who was perhaps the very, very worst of all at it. So, do do you know the name Walter Jackson Freeman II? I do now. Well, he invented lobotomies, and that's who we're talking oh. about today. <laughs> oh. The just the like, well, we'll just remove it. Yep. <laughs> we'll just we'll just we'll just scramble it up a little bit right. actually. Yeah. Oh, you yell too much? <laughs> we'll remove it. <laughs> oh, you had an unwanted pregnancy? We'll remove it. And not just the pregnancy part. No, actually, we will keep the pregnancy, but we'll scramble that brain up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, and I've heard, uh, I'm, well, I'm sure we'll touch on some of them, but I've just heard horror stories of like, well, we had a sister and then um, <laughs> she just wouldn't stop arguing with our parents. So she went away. She liked boys. Yeah. So we stuck a needle in her brain. Oh, <laughs> oh what a time it was. And Not all that long ago. Nest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, man, I am going to yeah. bunker down for this. Yeah. My yeah. dog is a registered therapy dog if you need to pet her. Okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. Is she... A registered lobotomist, Sophie, because I feel like there's a lot of money in that. Mm, no, but we'll look into it. <laughs> we'll look into it. Walter Jackson Freeman II was born on November 14th, 1895 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His father, 
Walter I, was also a doctor, but not a very good one. He hated the work, and he did it only grudgingly. Uh, he was like a, a, a an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and it was said that his ideal world would have been one in which people didn't have ears, noses, or throats, so he wouldn't have to work. Well, his son kind of um, took that one next level then. <laughs> like, oh, you want things just removed that you don't want to deal yeah. with? I'm that, that, That's what I'm going to do, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Walter Jackson II's uh, grandfather, Keen Freeman, was one of the most celebrated physicians of his age and was like the first doctor who did a bunch of important things. He was a legitimate, like, trailblazing medical motherfucker so uh walter freeman the second was a sick child which was not unusual in an era where the average fist fight came with a better prognosis than the average surgery he developed enlarged lymph nodes when he was 14 months old which his grandfather had to cut out the surgery worked but it permanently paralyzed some of the muscles in walter's shoulder and head uh walter the second also underwent a tonsillectomy and suffered from diphtheria scarlet fever the measles whooping cough the mumps and pink eye i don't want to say that god definitely Definitely wanted this baby dead, but I think the evidence speaks for itself. <laughs> yeah, they tried. Yeah, he tri- he, he did his best. <laughs> Young Walter's first memory was of the head of a pickaxe breaking through the wall of his nursery uh, as the result of a home demolition that got a little sloppy, which is a pretty pretty badass first memory. You got to give it to Oh, him. yeah, for sure. Also, uh, not too far off of an analogy of what he would later do to people's own lives. And not too far off from a great scene in The Shining, which starred Jack Nicholson, who was also in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's yes. Nest, a movie about a lobotomy. Ooh, that was a good not. We tied yeah. a lot of things together. <laughs> Uh, now, the wonderful biography uh, of Walter, the lobotomist, notes that he also nursed a lifelong fear of horses, but never knew why. That doesn't come up again. I just think it's interesting. <laughs> when people are terrified of something for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> And they can't let it go. Yeah. Well, I'm also afraid of horses. Okay, well, that's not what we're talking about today. All right, well, you need to put that in. Yeah, you need to, that needs to go in the book. Right. Are you scared of anything uh, on like an existential level that, that makes no sense to you? I don't, well, that's, but if you're scared of it, doesn't it make sense to you? So. Not always. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very afraid of prison. Okay, like, that makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. that's what, it, but, yeah, but it makes yeah. sense to me, but it is like. Yeah. When I just think about not being able to get out of somewhere that they oh, are yeah. destined to, like you know, like they're like, oh, we decide. Oh, I don't know. I don't like. It bothers me. That show, Sixty yeah. Days In. Have you watched that? <laughs> no, that sounds like a fucking nightmare, though. It's like a they embed civilians into like a prison system. The only no. person that knows no. that they're not an actual prisoner is the warden, and then. The camera crew sets up as though they're doing a documentary in the prison, but they use that to do like their confessional talking head moments. So they interview a lot of prisoners, but none of them assume, well, one of us isn't actually even supposed to be here. And their job is to like last 60 days. And uh, quite a few of them end up just getting beaten up. Yeah, that makes sense. one, One was bad at his cover story of what he was supposed to be in there for. So once you just start lying to other prisoners, they assume you must be a pedophile. And that's why you're like no pun intended KG about what you got in there for and that didn't end well for that guy either once d- d- once d- everybody d- was like oh you're a pedophile he's like no 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 and then they don't care about that that's what they think so you get beat up is like there a every, huge you get beat up like cash every prize day too. Is, I don't know if there is any cash prize I, I, I'm trying to think like you no. would have to it would have to be I would only do it for enough money that I would be able to buy a cabin in the woods like you would have to give me cabin in the woods money in order to like do that fucking thing but that sounds like the worst that's like like it would have to be nice woods with like a mountain and shit so so you for like 350 you would do it no 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 like five five five, five hundred is gonna be the low end of that shit i'm talking a nice cabin see one time i went when i toured alcatraz they let us go into the solitary confinement and they're like anybody want to check it out and then I, I thought, you know what? Lean in on your fear. So I went in and the guy shut the door. They're like, I don't know what you'd call it. Probably a park ranger at this point because of what Alcatraz is. And then the tour guide, whatever. And uh, then he pretended that the door was stuck and he couldn't get me out. <laughs> and I did not enjoy those few uh, very short moments that felt like very long hours. 
See, I would I would live in Alcatraz if it could just be my house and I had a sack of rifles and a, a, an internet connection. Um, <laughs> that would be fun. I could take pot shots at Silicon Valley. That would be satisfying. You, I, hey, um, <laughs> I would sign up for that podcast. Mm-hmm. You would, you <laughs> would, just kind you of... would need espresso too, Robert. Welcome back to yeah. Robert on the Rock. It's another episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should probably get back to okay. the uh, the podcast. So we were talking, he's scared of horses. Uh, now, when Walter was a small child, his family moved to an area near Rittenhouse Square, a once fancy but now slummy neighborhood. Uh, and this is again in Philadelphia. Now, Freeman would later recall it as a rather dingy place where nursemaids wheeled baby carriages and gossiped. Uh, Walter's family was quite well off, and he came up with maids and cooks and nannies to attend to his and his parents' every whim. He was not overly adventurous as a child, and later wrote of himself, On the whole, I think I was a sensitive, imaginative boy, docile, shut in a bit, and full of questions. His parents nicknamed him Little Walter YY, and the growing boy was particularly intrigued by the family business, medicine. He had a good relationship with his grandfather, but almost no real friends. The only boy he played with regularly was his younger cousin, Morris. The book The Lobotomist describes their friendship as basically identical to a Calvin and Hobbes strip. Walter and Morris nursed a mutual contempt for girls and made grand plans for the Society for the Prevention of Useless Girls, what? Spugs for short. Disdaining the company of other children, they set up another exclusive secret society, just two members strong, which they called the Walrus Club. Yeah, that's like the fucking Calvin and Hobbes strip. 100%. Yeah. And they got a transmogrifier. Wasn't that one yeah. of the things? Yeah, I they loved traveled Calvin through time. Yeah, so did I. It's kind of a bummer if you imagine this is what happened to Calvin when he grew up. No, I'm not doing I, that at no, all. No, don't do maybe that. More, don't do that. Maybe more Hobbes. I could see Hobbes getting into this line of work, but definitely not Scrambling Calvin. brains? <laughs> Now, Walter was a good student. He excelled in Latin and Greek, and he won prizes for his scholastics. He was never any good at sports, nor did he grow any more adept with the opposite sex as he blossomed into a teenager. He found girls bothersome and later wrote, I think I actively disliked girls until I went to college. This is all going to make so much sense later. This is all going to make so much sense immediately. Oh, okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Walter Freeman was the oldest of six siblings, all but two of whom were boys. He did not get along well with them, nor did he particularly care for his parents. Walter would later note repeatedly that he never loved his mother. He was only a little closer to his father, who took him and his brothers on regular hiking, fishing, and camping trips. The elder Walter hated his medical practice and considered the outdoors his only refuge. He was a weird dude. Once when Walter II was caught skipping school, his father punished him by whipping himself in front of the truant officer. Wait, whoa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The dad so, whipped himself or he had yeah. Walter the second. No, whip he him. whipped it. The dad whipped himself in front of the truant officer. You made like the me truant do officer. this to myself by skipping school. Yeah, and he did it in front of the cop. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> like, that's that's so fucked up. It takes like, you really have to process that shit. Yeah, because like, you're the only layers. fucking up the kid's head. You're like, you, yeah. you know that like, and I'm the even, truant officer. <laughs> imagine that guy. He's yeah, like, look, yeah. man. Hey, well, buddy, I just want kids to go to school. Why are we doing this? All you got to do is sign the sheet, man. All you got to do is sign the sheet that I told you he wasn't at school. Put the whip down. Why did you bring a whip to this meeting? You, uh, you don't need to do this. No one's asking you to do this. <laughs> Sir, I just want you to know, I'm also going to have to write you up. For right yeah. for whipping yourself because I have to document that I witnessed this. Yeah, he he's he, he missed a day of school. This isn't really a whipping situation. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered what you meant when you were like, "Cool, I'll bring my whip." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have trouble getting my head around what kind of man does that. <laughs> like, oh, I know. And then I'm sure the truant officer was like, wanted the kid to leave and then just like in uh, will ferrell and he spawned and down the dad was like let the boy watch <laughs> yeah oh that's i feel that's like, horrific that's a mind fuck yeah that's a galaxy level mind fuck mm -hmm. oh boy i bet that truant officer felt bad for that i bet in the future he was like you know what you, you need to stop skipping school but we're not going to tell your dad anybody again. <laughs> that truant officer let everyone skip yeah. He was like, I'm not going through that again. I am not doing that again. Mm -mm. <laughs> so, uh, as is probably not a surprise hearing that, 
uh, Walter's father was no less awkward when it came to talking to his young adult son about sex. <laughs> Years later, Walter recalled, I had been showing interest in the external anatomy of my young girl cousins. With the aid of his ancient textbooks on anatomy and gynecology illustrated with woodcuts, he dilated upon internal anatomy, reproduction, and especially venereal disease, threatening to have me followed or even tempted by operatives who would report to him. I was thoroughly uncomfortable, but remained a virgin. He never alluded to it again. What? So, if you're a young parent out there looking to stop your kid from fucking too early, this is one way to keep them a virgin for a very long time. Yeah, or watch Eraserhead. But yeah, or watch Eraserhead. Yeah. But okay, so he he got way yeah. into his. He said straight up, "I was really into my female cousin's anatomy." Yes. Yeah, Bloody. yeah, yeah. He well, you know, <laughs> you know that that's fucked up. Yeah. I think in an earlier age in which boys and girls did not socialize, like you run into stories like that a lot in the early 1900s just because like you weren't hanging out with any other girls. Mm-hmm. So like that's when people would have that real, it's it's messed up and a symptom of some unhealthy things in the culture. But I'm not going to say that that right there is evidence that Walter was weird from the beginning. Maybe they were the only girls he spent any time around. And like, I guess though, so when you say a- yeah. anatomy, to me it's like he... If it makes me feel like I guess I intone that he's more preoccupied. Like it's okay to wonder what's under their clothes, but don't start wondering what's under their skin. I, I think that was just sort of um, a euphemism they used because again, nobody had good vocabulary to talk about like <laughs> right. bodies back right. then. Like because right. everyone was fucked up and you know it was a, an, an, an even less healthy time. Right, there was no um, hot girl summer or no. Midwestern boy autumn, which I yeah. am currently a part of. Oh, oh yeah, that's yeah. Midwestern boy autumn is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Southeastern boy late summer slash early <laughs> fall, which really doesn't get going until November. Um, yeah, oh. we get a lot of them. I like slutty people April showers. That's my oh, favorite yeah. time of year. Slutty people April showers. Um, there has got... to be a porn star named April showers, right? Of course. Oh yeah, no, there's like one hundred percent. Okay, yeah. I hope so. And we're putting it in the universe if there isn't. Yeah. I also call dibs if any of us get into porn. I mean, we're that's going to be the sequel podcast to this one. Oh, uh, great. great. Robert Evans makes a porno. Um, <laughs> it is not going to be popular. Uh, back to Walter Freeman. Okay. So Walter graduated from high school when he was just 16 years old. Uh, he immediately started attending classes at Yale. Um, he was academically excellent, but completely miserable. He was too young and immature to get up to any kind of animal house type bonding shenanigans with his fellow young men. And his utter disdain for women made most kinds of socialization impossible. It turns out it's not great to be in college at age 16. Mm-mm. It's not, not the best time to do that. Uh, he briefly worked for the Yale Daily News, but was let go after he spilled a bunch of alphabetized subscriber cards in front of his editor. He joined the swim team at one point, but refused to practice when anyone was around. He didn't want people to see him with his shirt off. Um, So he's, you get a feel for the kind of young man Walter Freeman was. Mm -hmm. Not a comfortable one. No. Um, Now, and uh, and in fairness, knowing about his dad, how could he possibly have been? (laughs) Right. His initial degree program was engineering, but this track was disrupted at the end of his junior year when he ate a bad batch of raw clams and caught typhoid fever. He spent months laid up with this and an assortment of other ailments that took up the entirety of his first semester senior year at Yale. The long months he spent at hospitals and sickbeds helped Walter realize that he wanted something different out of life, a career in medicine. Mm Mm-mm. Now, he'd initially not wanted to go down that road, due largely to the fact that his father had told him it was a terrible life. Don't be a fucking doctor, as he whips himself. Right. Uh, (laughs) So instead... this isn't about you. I'm whipping myself because someone else left a muffin out on the counter. (laughs) This is their whipping, but I needed to talk to you. Also, he's third generation, so his dad probably was forced into it by his dad. Yeah. And so he... Maybe this was his one thing where he was trying to be like, you don't you do what you don't have. You don't have to do this. And it didn't matter. Mm. I feel like he's saying you don't have to do this. while everybody looks at him whipping himself and it's like, you really don't have to yeah, do that's this. A good point. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Walter 
seeing his dad uh, was a miserable, fucked up person, Mm -hmm. Walter instead looked towards his grandfather uh, as a role model and enrolled in summer classes at the University of Chicago to catch up on medical school before or to catch up on like medicine and science related classes before starting medical school the next year. He excelled in this as well and attempted to rebuild his health by walking 30 minutes to and from campus every day, carrying a heavy box of bones. I don't know where... What? You could just get bones back then. Yeah, he just decided he needed, he wanted to like get healthy, and the way to do it was to carry around a lot of bones. Right, and because he's a fucked up person, a rock isn't good enough. <laughs> no, there or, were more bones or, than rocks back then. There were just people dying left and right. That's so true. yeah, he yeah, stopped yeah, by H.H. Like, H. Holmes's place and picked up some. Yeah, wait, what year is this? Yeah. That doesn't check out. Yeah. Actually, I think it might check out. This is late late 1890s. Oh, I don't remember yeah. exactly when H.H. H. Holmes was fucking H. H. around. H.H. Holmes this is like, World Exposition this is like 19... Fair of 1892. No, he would have been. He would have been. He was born in 95. So okay, but there would have been there would have been a lot of bones lying yeah. around in the early 1900s for sure. Uh, f- bone heavy period. World War One was on. So oh, there a were lot of bones. Sh- shitloads of bones yep now yeah so he excelled in his classes and he was getting better you know healthier thanks to his bone box but in spite of all this he he got sick again very quickly and was soon bedridden he later recalled i wrote home saying i guessed god didn't want me to study medicine in reply i received a stern admonition not to think that way much less to mention it wait robert he got sick again yeah he kept he was very sick he was a sick sick young man oh man this is you're right. Mother Nature was trying to kill him. God was definitely trying to but, stop him from being. But a he, uh, he's a fighter. You got to give he's him. He's a that. fighter. He he is a persistent son of a bitch. He shouldn't have been. Mm-mm. Let it go. No, he should Some, not somebody, have been. Somebody should have walked in, whipping themselves, and been like, "This is yeah. so that you can let it go. Just go." Yeah, that's. I think that we have to land on the conclusion that if only there'd been more whipping in his childhood, he would have turned out better. Can I ask you a yeah. foreshadowing question that I, I don't absolutely ex- I don't expect you to answer yet because I don't know that we should even if you can. But okay, much like we all wonder, like what purpose does mosquitoes provide? Like mm-hmm. what uh, what do they give us in the long run or whatever, other than just bad yeah. stuff? I would love to know by the end of this episode. I already hate him. If at some point you're going to be like, well, actually, because of the lobotomy, we now have this positive thing in our world. And I'm anxious to see if and if that comes about at all. Yes, he was actually, this is getting ahead a little bit. Yeah, but I, mean, I didn't want to do that to you. I'm just, yeah. that's what's already in my head. I'm like, yeah. I hope there's yeah. some benefit to this fucker. Yeah, the spoiler I'll give you is that it turned out he was right for the wrong reasons, or at least he was right, but it led him to do the wrong things. Oh, like the little kid um, in a Bronx tale. I've not seen in a Bronx Oh, tale. he covers Bronx for tale. he covers for a mob guy and he asks his dad, Robert De Niro, he goes, I did a I did a good thing, right, Dad? And he goes, Yeah, you, you did a good you did a good thing for a bad man. Like it was oh, the okay. right thing, but you did it for yeah. the wrong person. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. a little different than that. Okay. We'll get we'll we'll get there. Okay. So after a second tonsillectomy, uh Freeman's <laughs> health improved and soon he was off to medical school. Doc, during the first hand. Bones in hand. During the First World War, he was drafted into the Army Medical Corps, and he became a sergeant while he continued his education. He was demoted once for threatening his company commander with a shoe, but otherwise had a solid service We're record. We're not. We can't skip this. <laughs> yeah, with a shoe? You, with a shoe. Just a little shoe fight. You've had a couple. I've never had a shoe fight. We, we all have the odd shoe fight. Ike and Tina Turner. That's the most popular shoe yeah. fight of all time. Yeah, it was just like a, a an argument, and he like picked up his shoe and yelled at somebody, and didn't realize they he they were his commanding officer. Mm, um, okay. It's less interesting than you'd think. It's funnier when you just summarize it that way. <laughs> true. True. Um, now, Walter graduated as a doctor in 1920, the second in his class. By this point, he had become so enamored with medicine that every other aspect of his past had followed by the wayside. Medicine, he wrote, held my interest to the point where I excluded many other things. In fact, I was barely aware of my family. Do not recall what they were doing or where they were during this period. So, Walter has fallen fully into medicine. And speaking of falling fully into something... Daniel Van Kirk. Yes. It's time for us and our audience to fall fully into the products and services that support this program. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's let's whip ourselves in front of the audience to convince them <laughs> to buy these these products that uh support the show. 
imagine me wailing on myself with a cat of nine tails. It, while I, it makes me sad, but you, I didn't come to school, and so now you have to hurt yourself. And yeah, now I have to hurt myself. Products. We're back. So when we left off, Walter Freeman had fallen in love with medicine and was, had forgotten what his family was even doing. He was so uh, enthralled with his new career. Uh, and in his father's case, what he was doing was dying of liver cancer. Whoa. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Walter uh, could not really have cared less about this. The only thing he did to help his father during this period, because he was living at home still, was periodically shave him with a straight razor. He refused to soften his dad's stubble in warm water before shaving him because, quote, the task was distasteful and I finished it as quickly as possible. I'm sure my mother would have been more gentle, but she considered shaving a man's job and I was the only one at home. <laughs> so, like, I'm gonna, I'll shave you, dad, but I'm not gonna, like, make it pleasant for you because I no. want to get done with this shit quick. Yeah. Right. Great, great kid. Now, although... His dad was uh, kind of fucked him up, so fair, I guess. Right. You have As, to whip me. I can't do it myself. <laughs> I can't get shaved without a whipping. <laughs> As a medical intern, Walter was somewhat uneven. He excelled at neurology, but proved less apt at handling what he called scut work, like transporting urine samples for analysis. Sometimes he would pour samples down the drain just to be rid of them. He was fascinated by neurosurgery, but too bored of the details of it to actually learn to perform uh, surgery. He was fascinated by illness, but almost bored by the actual human beings he had to treat. He was, in short, a very strange dude, as this passage from The Lobotomist makes clear. Soon another patient commanded Freeman's curiosity, a young man who arrived at the hospital with his penis in dire shape. Inflamed and dark, the organ was encircled by a ring that the patient's girlfriend had thrust over it, but was unable to remove. Wait. Freeman ended... Yep. We're talking like 1920s cock rings? I think we're talking a normal ring that she put on his cock, and it became a problem when he got hard. No. Yeah, that's why you use the like the bendy rubber ones yes, and not like a course. normal metal ring. Yeah, that's one yeah. of our sponsors today. But Yes. Uh, <laughs> Josiah and Sons old-fashioned Amish cock rings, the only cock rings that are made entirely out of wood. If you want the most pain a cock ring can put you in, you want a Josiah and Sons cock ring. Ugh, that was too perfect. Now in Redwood. <laughs> So a guy walks in and says, hey, I got to I got to And you know that that conversation was awkward because much like you yeah. just talked about, no one was using good, like yeah. healthy, like jargon for each other to talk about themselves. Or I, their I don't anatomies. think anyone uses the word penis in that entire conversation. I've it takes 20 problem- minutes. He's like, I've gone problematic <laughs> in my nethers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Uh, Freeman ended the patient's agony by filing through the ring and twisting it free with forceps. The boy asked for the ring, but I told him it was a specimen and that I would have to keep it, Freeman wrote. I had the ring repaired and the Freeman man crest engraved on it. For years afterward, Freeman wore the specimen on a gold chain. Oh. <laughs> Later in his career. <laughs> if we were in an episode of Mindhunters, this is what we would call a trophy. Yeah, that's fucked up. Yes. Um, yeah, what a conversation is... starter, though. <laughs> yeah. I like oh, that nice... ring. Oh, you do? I'll tell you a little Took something it from about a this deck. ring. <laughs> that crest after market. Because this used to be a, <laughs> it, it, this used to be a broken ring. How so? Well, a gentleman came in, had it in his nethers. I took it off, and now I proudly present it. <laughs> Wow. Oh, man. Wow. That, yeah. Hey, real quick, think about this. There's a chance, unless he was buried with it, that ring is out there somewhere. God, I hope so. If you have Walter Freeman's cock ring necklace, I would pay good money to have it. Me too. I don't too. know what I would do with it. We'll find a use for it. If you could start collecting things from your episodes and you'd be like the collector in guardians of the galaxy yep. in the marvel universe yep, you're like yep. oh that's actually from the episode where we talk about because that ring has got to be i bet somebody doesn't even know what they have or necklace, if i get a tv now. show that would be that would be the premise is me hunting down artifacts of terrible people we'll start with like an original copy of of one of hitler's favorite uh fantasy novels yes but uh yeah 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 saddam hussein's typewriter you know all the all the all the great all the hits mm-hmm the L. Ron Hicks. Hubbard's, I don't know, uh, uh, boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> or like that first episode I did where we talked about the Nazis in Hollywood. Like even an old mm-hmm. like Lemley's like movie card. Oh hell yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh. Oh man, there's a lot of things to collect. Okay, sorry I have derailed us, but that. that yeah. co- I mean, how could I not? We just went. We just no, it's, went it's, full on. It's Dr. a Conquering. wild tale. Yeah. So Walter spent a year in Europe doing medical residences in France and performing medical testing on animals. The highlight of his trip was watching the autopsy of an elephant. He was fascinated by the four-hour task of opening the creature's skull to remove its brain. Walter's first thought was that a jackhammer would have been the ideal tool to remove it. This thought process spawned a lifelong fascination in finding unique ways to break into skulls and access brains. Mm. He is into that. Hey, now, do, do what you love. You'll never work a day in your life. Do what you love and the money will follow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> his first major job came courtesy of his grandfather, Keen, who used his connections to get his grandson a gig as the senior medical officer in charge of St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. This was a psychiatric hospital, and working there gave Walter a direct look into the horrific ways 1920s America treated the mentally unwell. St. Elizabeth was essentially a giant box-filled warehouse from the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, but filled with sick people instead of antiquities. There were very few real treatments for psychiatric disorders, so patients were just locked in there together until they either died or lied well enough to claim that they had had a spontaneous remission. So that was that was healthcare back then. Mm -hmm. Oh, your your head's sick, huh? Well, we're gonna put you in a miserable box until you decide you're healthy. Yeah, yeah. Walter Freeman found this new charge horrifying. He was sickened by the 4,300 inmates of his asylum, and he wrote, The slouching figures, the vacant stare or averted eyes, the shabby clothing and footwear, the general untidiness all aroused rejection rather than sympathy or interest. So he's, he's horrified and not sympathetic with these people. Yeah, they're now, t- he doesn't feel bad for them at all. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're just, uh, he's just disgusted by them. Now, since the inmates of this asylum were too pitiful to deserve Walter's sympathy, he instead focused on learning about the brain of the psychotic, as he called it, which is, again, was like the general, it's a specific term now, it was just Mm -hmm. the general term for anyone that was, like, not fitting into society back then. Yeah, you couldn't conform. Yeah, Walter's goal was less to alleviate discomfort and more to help these people return to life as productive members of capitalist society. Quote, I looked around me at the hundreds of patients and thought, what a waste of manpower and woman power. So again, not particularly sympathetic to their suffering. No, but I like Towards the gender end, inclusiveness. He, he is very gender inclusive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Towards this end, he experimented with differing oxygen levels and their impacts on the brain of manic people. He also pioneered a new, easier method of collecting spinal taps from the lobotomist. Instead of recruiting help to secure patients in a deep bend while sitting, then inserting the needle of a collection syringe between the vertebra, Freeman employed what he was fond of calling the Jiffy Spinal Tap. Without assistance from other staff members, Freeman directed patients to sit backward on a chair and deeply bend their neck over the chair back. Carefully navigating the opening at the base of the skull, he then pushed a needle into a reservoir of spinal fluid located just inside, but perilously close to the base of the brain. Even a slight error in the insertion of the needle could permanently injure the patient. He's just showing off. He's just showing off. And this this risk was worth it because it allowed him to work alone without close collaboration with colleagues. Um, now a mature adult, Walter was still very much a loner, and he preferred his own professional company to acting as part of a team, even when that went, meant a greater risk to the patient. Walter opened a private practice while working at St. Elizabeth's to further his research and also took a job as a professor of neurology at George Washington University. By the early 1930s, he had a well-earned reputation as a psychiatric pioneer. <laughs> Now, Walter was largely responsible for the introduction of several exciting new treatments, insulin shock therapy, which plunged patients into insulin shock to try and correct schizophrenic symptoms. He also experimented with metrazole shock therapy and electroconvulsive therapy. The essential goal of all these treatments was the same, to slap sick people out of their issues by horribly traumatizing their system. Wow. So he's that kind of doctor. He's like, ah, these people have a problem. We just need to fuck them up enough that they uh, now, see, the they, only, they get their shit together. The only time right. I know of something like this working is in heat stroke. Because you instantly need to be put into an ice tub right away. Like we need to yeah. shock you out of the thing you're in. But yeah. the idea that we could take anything psychologically and essentially smack you out of it through one form of mild torture or another is yeah. insane who did this ever work enough that somebody was like i think this is the way to do it you know um 
so one, uh, there's a couple of things going on here. One of them is that electroconvulsive therapy is still at a very small scale use today. There are certain people with certain fairly rare problems that it can help. Really? So I'm sure there were some people who had very severe psychiatric distress who were helped by the electroconvulsive therapy, a tiny fraction of the total. Right. And I'm sure there was a larger number who were, while they had issues, were also able to realize like, oh my God, they're going to keep torturing me if I don't pretend to be better. And so they would just like, okay, I'll be better. Yeah, I won't, I won't, I like, won't let you know I'm suffering. Isn't yeah. that kind of like the mouse in the maze? Like, yeah. Oh, I just got to stop this so that that doesn't happen to me anymore. Yeah. Like, but I you're think learning that's... through like, not you're learning through just like Pavlovian dog type shit of like, this yeah. just happens to you every time. So you just learn to like stop being loud, but nothing's changed. Yeah, that's kind of, I think, what goes on with a lot of these people. It's a mix of the tiny amount who, like, legitimately do benefit from it because electroconvulsive therapy can right. be helpful. Right. And a larger number who are like, oh, this is awful. I'll just stop complaining. Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't want to go through this anymore. Right. Um, now, it was 1935 when Walter Freeman first ran into the treatment that would come to define his practice and the great bulk of his adult life. That year, he attended a presentation in London by a researcher who had experimented with damaging the frontal lobes of chimpanzees just to see what happened. The results were more or less what you'd expect. These brain-damaged chimps became quiet, listless, inactive. Freeman and a Portuguese neurologist, Igus Moniz, were both fascinated by this. Moniz right away headed back home to Portugal to experiment with severing the frontal lobes of human beings. The thinking was that if this procedure could calm chimpanzees down, it might have the same effect on people suffering from a mental illness that led to radical swings in personality and mood. Stuff like a bipolar disorder. If that's exactly like what I was going to say. Seizure disorders and yeah. stuff. A whole bunch of different things. Because again, a lot of stuff that we now recognize are separate things were all lumped together back in that day. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were like a schizophrenic or if you had a seizure disorder or if you were bipolar, they might just say, lump all those people together yep. as the same thing you know they weren't great at this yet uh in 1936 antonio moniz had perfected his treatment the leucotomy which involved drilling two small holes in the side of the head in order to sever connective tissue that attached the frontal lobe to the rest of the brain now at the time there were two main theories of psychiatric illness the first which was pushed by guys like freud was that psychiatric ailments were all basically the result of buried memories misplaced desires past traumas things that you could sit down and work out with a psychotherapist over a small mountain of cocaine and on a comfortable couch. The other theory was that these illnesses were caused by emotional signals from the brain that were so strong they simply overwhelmed a person. Now, obviously, neither theory is entirely right, um, but the theory that uh, guys like Freeman would adopt, which was that, you know, these it was a bunch of signals from the brain, was closer to right than Freud's theory because it explains stuff like, you know, um, uh, seizure disorders mm -hmm. or like schizophrenia and stuff, which are not, you can't talk therapy, someone with schizophrenia out of having issues. Like it's a problem with like signals their brain is sending right. and they need some sorts of medication. Uh, I think sometimes surgery helps. But like, so... Freeman is on the right track. What he and other scientists who like adopt this school of thought are realizing is that you can't talk your way through all of your mental problems, which is correct. There are mental problems that have to be dealt with on like more of a chemical, physical level. So that's what I say when I say he he was he was right about sort of what the issues were. Yeah. Um, but then we get into what he decided the treatment should be, which mm -hmm. was not correct. But he was on the right track when he like figured out like what was going on with people where he was closer to right than a lot of mainstream doctors. So uh, Moniz's leucotomy seemed to provide relief to a number of patients, and I should note that there are variants of this procedure we use today. Patients suffering from some types of seizure disorders sometimes have parts of the brain disconnected from one another to stop or reduce the frequency of said seizures. We still do use brain surgery that's kind of an evolution of the leucotomy yeah. to treat people today, and it can be very helpful to, again, a very small number of people who suffer with these disorders. Um, so so Moniz was experimenting with real medicine, and he was very responsible with the implications of his treatment. When he received the Nobel Prize for it in 1949, he insisted the leucotomy was only to be used as a treatment of last resort, when absolutely nothing else could provide a patient with relief. So M Moniz, not going to say is a bad guy, he he's one of the early experimenters with what would come to be known as a lobotomy, but he's he's doing it because, number one, he recognizes it does help in some cases, and he's, he's very clear about, like, we only do this if there's no other chance of them living 
living a normal life. Right. Or if we want to fuck with a chimpanzee. That was the other guy. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. Sorry. Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Moniz just watched that and was like, oh, shit, this might that's help right. people. Yeah. 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 Now, Walter Freeman paid attention to the work of Antonio Moniz, but he was not convinced the leucotomy ought to be a last resort for suffering people. As the manager of an asylum, he was deeply frustrated by how much time and manpower it took to subdue patients dealing with psychotic episodes, schizophrenic breaks, manic phases, etc. The idea that all this could be calmed by the just chopping up their brains was deeply appealing to him. Yeah, let's so for, start yeah. there. Yeah, that'll, that'll make it. Wait, my job's so I much easier. I got 4,300 people I'm sick of. Why are we yeah, even, what if even I just talk break them? them? Just line them up. <laughs> <laughs> so Freeman developed a modification of Moniz's procedure and renamed it a lobotomy in much the same way as Oreos modified the Hydrox cookie. And like <laughs> Oreos, Freeman's procedure was destined to capture the vast majority of the market share for such a product. And like Oreos, you got to get to that middle good stuff and get that out. You got you got to get that out. Now, I'm going to quote now from Jack L. High, who wrote The Lobotomist and also wrote this piece for The Washington Post. To him, the intoxicating thing about psychosurgery, Moniz's coined term for psychiatric surgery, was its potential to sever the links between the overexcited emotions of an unhealthy thalamus and the behavioral functions of the prefrontal lobes of the brain. If it worked, the destruction of these nerve fibers would prevent the thalamus from poisoning patients' thinking. He absorbed the details of Moniz's work and, with neurosurgeon Watts, became figuring out how to adapt the Portuguese physician's techniques. Freeman and Watts used brains from the hospital morgue to practice the coring of sections of the prefrontal frontal lobes with a leucotome, which is the device they'd used for that. Mm -hmm. By the summer of 1936, they were ready for a live patient, a Miss Hammett from Topeka, Kansas. Now, Miss Hammett was 63 years old. She suffered from depression. She had frequent hysterical fits and difficulty sleeping. Freeman talked with her and concluded that a lobotomy was the only way for her to avoid spending the rest of her life in a mental hospital. Much of the impetus behind this seems to have been her husband, who was tired of dealing with a wife who needed help herself rather than just preparing meals for him and staying quiet. Freeman and his new partner, Watts, scheduled Miss Hammett for an appointment on September 14th, 1936. Now, the first lobotomy did not start off well. Miss Hammett tried to back out when she learned the procedure would require her to shave her head. Many of her mental health issues focused around an obsession with her thinning hair, so this was obviously a matter of grave concern for her. Whoa. Yeah. We're doing the one thing she's already upset about. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Freeman and Watts assured her they would only have to shave off a few small sections of her scalp. This was a lie, obviously. Once they'd forcibly anesthetized her, they shaved her bald. Freeman recorded that her last words before going under were, Who is that man? What does he want here? What is he going to do to me? Tell him to go away. Oh, I don't want to see him. Yeah, well, that's how crazy people talk. So sit still. I don't think that... Oh, yeah, that's him. Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. think she's very reasonable oh, here. 100%. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. my point. Once once yeah. you've been like labeled, we're going to do this to you, no matter what you say, they're like, well, you would talk like that. You're a crazy. You need You're help. You're a loony loon. Yeah. With Freeman watching, Watts drilled six holes atop Miss Hammett's skull and inserted a leucotome, a device that essentially holed the brain, into each hole. Both doctors worked together on lesioning the brain, with Watts, the actual surgeon, managing the whole affair. And as odd as it sounds, the lobotomy seems to have helped Miss Hammett. At least, she and her husband both reported that it helped. Freeman wrote in his autobiography, She survived five years, according to Mr. Hammett, the happiest years of her life. As she expressed it, she could go to the theater and really enjoy the play without thinking of what her back hair looked like or whether her shoes pinched. And it is entirely possible that this is an accurate representation of how Miss Hammett felt. Many of Dr. Freeman's lobotomy patients experienced relief from some of their symptoms. That said, even the positive experiences with lobotomies are clouded by deeply disturbing questions of consent and structures of oppression. Wait, they're saying that... Speaking of... Sorry, sorry. I just really... They're saying it actually worked? Yeah, Yeah, she she experienced relief. That was not wildly uncommon with his patients. Yeah, but... If she's worried about her shoes and stuff, it kind of sounds to me like, and I know we're near professional, and, and so please take this with a grain of salt, anyone who hears my voice, but maybe she suffered some some sort of like OCD. She was like worried yep. about. Yep. Uh, yep. And so the lobotomy just made her not really care about anything. So they're yep. like, oh, things are better. Well. Yep. No, you just don't care about anything. That's not. Yep. I guess. It's, yeah. I guess you're not doing the thing you did, but. I don't know if that falls into the category of better, but but for them at the time, they were saying that for is, that's them a success. at the time, this woman was complaining. Now the woman's not complaining. We fixed her. Okay, 
Well, it's a different. Yeah, we're going to get into that a little bit more and how problematic all this was. But again, it's important, you know, that at the time this looked to, again, the men who were the only ones whose opinions mattered in the situation as if they were making people like Mrs. Hammett better. Gotcha. Um, now, you know what will make you better, Daniel Van Kirk? Hmm. The products and services that advertise on this show. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can we go and, to them? Mm-hmm. Can I learn about them? Mm-hmm. We okay. can. Here's a capitalism lobotomy. We're back. Now, uh, as I said before we rolled out, uh, the positive experiences with lobotomies that you read about when you kind of read about these early uh, operations um, were all clouded by very disturbing questions of consent and also structures of oppression that existed back then and still exist today. During my research, I came across a StoryCorps interview with one of Walter Freeman's patients, Patricia Moen, and her husband. Patricia, w- or her husband's name is Glenn, by the way. Patricia was lobotomized in 1962, and I'm going to read the transcript of this husband and wife talking about her procedure. And again, this is considered to be like one of the stories of like a success but i'll read this to you and you tell me if you think there's something fucked up going on here. i bet i will glenn moen my name is glenn moen i am 79 years old i signed the release for pat's lobotomy patricia moen we have not talked about it since i had the lobotomy i don't think ever my husband is not a great communicator glenn i don't talk to her any more than i have to patricia glenn be nice both laugh we'd been married about 13 years and it just started i cried all the time i was just mentally no good glenn one night i came home and she said well i've done it now she'd taken a whole bottle of some kind of pills patricia that's when the doctor decided it was time glenn he told me this was the last resort i didn't know what else to do patricia dr freeman said you can come out of this a vegetable or you can come out dead and i guess i was miserable enough that i didn't care glenn i was kind of worried because of the operation of severing a nerve in the brain it sounded kind of wild to me patricia he was afraid he was going to lose his cook glenn and i don't like to cook patricia i remember nothing after i saw dr freeman i don't remember going to the hospital or having it done or how long i was there that's all gone glenn we were coming back from san jose after the operation and pat informed me that she couldn't wait to get home because she wanted to file for divorce patricia hmm i don't remember that at all. I don't think I said it. Glenn, I think I just went on driving and ignored the situation and began to wonder myself how much good did this operation accomplish. Really, I can see no changes in most areas except she is much easier to get along with. Patricia, you didn't see any change in the way I kept the house or the way I... Glenn, mm, no... Patricia, I was more a free person after I'd had it, just not so concerned about things. I just went home and started living, I guess is the best way I can say it. I was able to get back to taking care of things and cooking and shopping and that kind of thing. Glenn, delighted at the way it's turned out. It's been a good life. Wow. Yeah, that's... There's <laughs> a lot going on there. My favorite, I hope on Glenn's tombstone, who we know is definitely yeah. dead by now, it says, I ignored it and kept driving. I ignored it and kept driving. That's probably how he lived a lot of his life with her until he had yep. to deal with her ass because she wouldn't do the things she was supposed to and kept complaining yeah. about wanting more pills. She wasn't happy cooking and shopping, so we drilled a hole in her brain and then it was fine. You know what? I'm also going to claim ignorance here, my friend. Yeah. I was under the assumption before we started this that if you got a lobotomy, you were just a shell of a person, that you were a vegetable or you died. Like uh, That happened a lot. But but some people just kind of went into like an, uh, I don't know if euphoric is the right word, but a like just a laissez-faire feeling towards life yeah. after a lobotomy. Like they still were very yeah. cognitive. They just didn't really have any argument nerves left. Yeah, that's it, it, it. Separating the frontal lobe in the way that they did kind of separates you from your concerns in some ways. It yeah. stopped people from feeling or thinking as much. You're just um, very agreeable. Yeah, that was kind of the best case scenario with some of these people. Um, but some did they again, what, did they detach too much or go too deep? Yeah, and they, that's when you get catatonic. Yeah, we'll get into that. Okay. I mean, it's it wasn't an exact science. It and just they blew me away. Good at it. That just blew me away yeah. to hear that exchange because I've been sitting yeah. here the whole time thinking every lobotomy ends with just a feeling of like no, 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 you're gone. No, you, a lot you, of these you're people. A shell. A lot of these people went on to live productive lives. A lot really? of them were rendered catatonic. It kind of depended on how the operation went. Like, the thing is, brains are weird. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've known people who have been shot through the head with rifles um, and well, wound up we're, fine. We're, um, we're definitely not getting yeah. a rifle in the studio then. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, they wound up fine. We could just. <laughs> uh, it's just it's kind of a crapshoot with brains. It's it's wild the amount of things that they can go through uh, and suffer no noticeable effects, and it's wild the number of things that can happen to them that seem minor and just change the person forever. For sure. Like it's a fucking crapshoot. Yeah. Look at the um, NFL. Look at the NFL. Exactly. Now, Mrs. Hammett's lobotomy in 1936 proved to be the beginning of a decades-long career carving into the brains of human beings. He and Watts were one of medicine's most dynamic duos following that operation. They established an office at a home in Washington, D.C., and gradually refined their technique, replacing Moniz's leucotome with an object Jack L. High describes as resembling a butter knife. They also switched around the positioning of the holes from which they cut into the brain. When patient symptoms persisted, Watts and Freeman would perform multiple lobotomies and make deeper cuts into the brain. One patient a lawyer suffering from alcoholism escaped the hospital after his operation and was found drunk in a downtown bar one patient showed up after his surgery and threatened to murder the doctors two pulled guns when freeman recommended they undergo lobotomies so it was not always a smooth process Mm -hmm. From early on, Freeman viewed proper PR as critical to gaining widespread adoption for his new technique. He and Watts started setting up a lobotomy booth at the annual AMA convention in 1939, crafting displays designed to draw the attention of journalists rather than impressing other doctors. He later wrote, I found the technique of getting noticed in the papers. It was to arrive a day or two ahead of the opening of the convention and install the exhibit in the most graphic manner and then be alert for prowling newsmen. Now, Jack L. High notes that Freeman used handheld clackers to get the attention of reporters with loud noises. He and Watts even lobotomized a monkey in 1939. This spectacular event dominated coverage of the convention. Freeman wrote, That night our monkey died, but Watts and I made the headlines even though we did not get an award. <laughs> and so, so begins all press is good press. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what yeah. he's going for here. That's what he's going for. Well, the monkey died, but people seem to be interested. <laughs> Wow. Now, 55% of the first 623 surgeries Watson Freeman carried out had what they described as good results. Uh, 32% were fair and 13% were poor. 3% died uh, during or immediately after the surgery. And if you take Freeman's word for it, those are good results. More than half of people had like a, a good result of the operation, uh, particularly considering these tended to be patients who had exhausted conventional treatment options. However, Freeman never went into detail about what he considered to be a good result, nor did he update his results when patients relapsed, which was extremely common. But remember, Nurses he was re- happy with the result of that monkey dying. So he was, he was because they got the press. Yeah. Yeah. Now, nurses reported that patients of the duo often needed to relearn how to eat and handle other basic tasks. They soiled themselves, flirted bizarrely with orderlies, and would sit staring off into the distance for hours on end. Walter Freeman considered these positive changes. The fact that lobotomy patients were dull, quiet, uncoordinated, and lazy was, he felt, an improvement over manic episodes and excessive activity. Many officials at mental hospitals felt the same way. Freeman Watts patients were much easier to deal with on a long-term basis since many of them just sat around quietly. By 1945, Walter had started to experiment with new methods of lobotomy. He was frustrated by the fact that the procedure required a skilled neurosurgeon. That meant he could only perform the operation when Watts was around, which dramatically limited the number of people he could properly lobotomize. Mm -hmm. This was a problem because he'd come to believe that lobotomies worked best for patients in the early stages of their illness. If people waited too long, he feared, the lobotomy might not really help. So he's like, we yeah. got to get into this shit faster. This needs to be like the first thing we're doing the for sick people. The very first, yep. You, yeah. you feeling down today? Sit in this chair and yeah. shave your head. I'll be right yeah. there. Now, Walter started looking into the research of other doctors, and he found an Italian surgeon named Amaro Fiamberti. Armano had developed a new procedure for reaching the brain without drilling careful holes in the skull. Instead, Armano broke into the skull through a soft bone at the rear of the eye socket. Working on corpses, Freeman developed a method of accessing the frontal lobe of the brain through the eye socket using an ice pick from his kitchen. Working in secret, so Watts wouldn't find out, Freeman started performing solo lobotomies in January of 1946. He operated out of the office he and Watts shared, but during hours when he knew his partner would not be in the building. Freeman ice-picked nine human brains in short order, sending his patients home in a taxi cab. Next, according to the Washington Post... 
Freeman later wrote that during his 10th transorbital surgery, he called Watts to his office to assess the operation. Watts later claimed, however, that he entered Freeman's office unsummoned and found Freeman pushing an ice pick in the eye socket of an unconscious man. Freeman audaciously asked Watts to hold the ice pick so Freeman could take a photograph. Whichever account is true, no one disputes the result of this encounter. Watts threatened to break off their partnership if Freeman persisted in performing lobotomies himself and treating them as office procedures done without surgical gloves or sterile draping. For the remainder of his association with Watts, Freeman did these operations outside the office. So that's cool. Uh, yeah. Now, Watts and Freeman would later fall out professionally over the issue of transorbital lobotomies. Although Watts retained a deep respect for his partner, he couldn't get over his belief that brain surgery ought to only be carried out by a competent brain surgeon, not random guys with an ice pick. <laughs> so Wild. controversial. What a yeah. crazy stance. And Freeman was like, you are far out there. No, have you seen this ice pick? <laughs> Children should be able to fix cars, and non-brain surgeons should be able to put ice picks through people's eyes. I believe that. Yeah. Me now, too. a book the two men authored on the subject of lobotomies includes this paragraph. The authors regret to announce that they have been unable to reach an agreement on the subject of transorbital lobotomy. Freeman believes that he has proved the method to be simple, quick, effective, and safe to entrust to the psychiatrist. Watts believes that any procedure involving cutting of the brain tissue is a major operation and should remain in the hands of a <laughs> neurological surgeon. This is when you're in a relationship with somebody and you're like, I don't yeah. even know why we're fighting about this. Yeah. <laughs> why are we even fighting about this? I'm just I'm just ice picking some motherfuckers. Like, why are you angry? Right, right. We shouldn't even be having this fight. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. This book, Psychosurgery and the Treatment of Mental Disorders and Intractable Pain, made an enormous splash in the world of medicine when it was first published in 1950. The tome featured language not often used in works of medicine, like the term scrawny frayed cats used to refer to a group of patients. This lurid prose, along with the gauche marketing technique used by Freeman to attract the press, alienated many mainstream medical professionals. But the book was popular and cemented Freeman's status as a radical physician working on the cutting, or perhaps poking, edge of medical science. On the eve of his 52nd birthday, he wrote, I have a feeling of competence and assurance that is almost grandiose. Maybe it comes from superb health, and maybe from the fruition of dreams that have proved within my grasp. But anyhow, I'm sitting on top of the world. So that's good. He's yeah. happy. Yeah, he's what happy. What more do you want? In our next episode, we're going to talk about the second phase of Walter Freeman's career. We're also going to discuss the most famous patient he and Watts ever operated on, the poster victim of lobotomy and sister to President John F. Kennedy, yeah. Rosemary Kennedy. Yeah. But right now, Daniel Van Kirk, it's time for you to plug some pluggables. Uh, I want to let everybody know I have my first comedy album coming out. It's on uh, it's on Blonde Medicine. Uh, that's the label. And it will drop on November 15th, Friday, November 15th. It's called Thanks, Diane. I recorded it in Los Angeles at the UCB Theater. And uh, if this is before the 15th when you're hearing this, you can go to DanielVanKirk.com and pre-order it or just go to the iTunes Store app on your phone, specifically the iTunes Store app, and you'll be able to pre-order it there. But on 11-15 or any time there, after you can get it anywhere that you get your music or listen to such things i should say music but it feels like it's also for comedy uh but it's called thanks diane and go to daniel van kirk for all of my tour dates as well as my own podcast pen pals or dumb people town and i'm robert evans uh and you can find me here on the podcast you're currently listening to so please keep listening to this podcast uh you can find our sources on behind the bastards.com you can find us uh on twitter and instagram at, at bastards pod you can find me on twitter at i write okay uh you can also find a lobotomy if you show up at my door and pay me 45 dollars. i have an ice pick uh, robert, sophie we, you can, cannot be doing these brain surgeons need to do these I feel like anyone can do these we this, if they have an ice pick. Having this argument, I I feel like <laughs> Daniel Daniel I re I respect <laughs> your opinion on this, but I disagree with it. Well, and I respect your expertise, but I think you need to wear gloves. Oh, gloves? You mean coward's hands? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the, the fucking episode. Buy a t-shirt on Tee Public and go off into the world and perform unlicensed lobotomies. Or not. Nope, Sophie, we're we're pro lobotomy now. Or not. <laughs>